Brian. 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 So start at? I did. <laughs> and now she's trying to tell me how to say it. Do I say Carolina? Carolina. I know I spelled it wrong, but like signing books. Carolina. 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 Yeah. Carolina. Carolina. And if I stumble, you'll forgive me. Oh yes, absolutely. So how do I find my books? Angelica, Pam, Carolina, Lucas, Moran. That's great. Thank you. Valerie and Susan Hunter. No. 
that'll be fun. <laughs> I never partied that hard. <laughs> uh, she keeps me young. <laughs> oh, I know. Not me. Everybody, How are you? Good. Everybody that comes Hi. to visit me, you know, they, they have to go downtown. Yeah, we had a blast. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. We went to um, Casa Rosa, which is uh, Miranda Lambert's place. It was really nice. All I want to know is what time did you guys get here? Like 4 a.m. Oh. Oh. Me and Terry were still up talking. I'm like, I thought you were coming in now. So you're just kind of going on the adrenaline rush. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's nice I mean, because I don't usually go out. Right. I'm I have a mom. I'm a mom. Nice to meet you. Well, I'm, I'll be 40 this year, but um, <laughs> my kids are so little that they wear me out. I have a six and a four year old, and I'm a single mom, so it's like. Been there. Testing. Like it sounds good. <laughs> when all my friends would go testing, out. testing. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, you're the share team over there. Huh? I'm Jeff Chase, by the way. Hi, Angelica. Hi, nice Angelica. to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Carolina. Yes. Yeah. Did I get it right? You got it right. I'm Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. Fantastic. Carolina. Yeah. Carolina. Does everybody have, am I going to be Jeffa? <laughs> Carolina. <laughs> Angelica. <laughs> It's Angelica, but you know. Which would be Hefe. It's amazing. Hefe. Hefe. Hefe, which is boss. Mm -hmm. It's bad. Angelica. Is it brutality? What kind of a. Um, have you already had something this morning? Or is this the first thing you're having this morning? This morning. Why are we having something? I was just curious what kind of. Uh, how many people have signed up? Oh, I don't know that. All I did. That's why they have better comments. Yeah. You didn't really receive something, something from them? I yeah. And you I should know. You would receive something from them. So go to your messages. Yeah, that's not bad. I was having trouble even with it. Oh, yeah. here. Yeah. It's very 20. <coughs> no, that's the, that's you sending it. Yeah. They usually go by your followers. Like if you have a lot of followers, they, you know how it is. Wait, they said they mentioned me there. Um, so you sent it to them? But I'm here. I'm functioning. <laughs> and why are these people? Like, this is Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, how are you? This is Kelsey. If you accept, and you'll see what these people want. I, I won't take them every A lot week of people just want to get money. Call just is what did she say? Just say just like, nothing. Uh, oh, she was just like, I just did yeah. something. Fantastic. But I mean, just check them because you never know. And I'm going to lately, it's been a little bit like, so just, you know, just clap them. And it will be for another couple of weeks. And then. In DC? In DC, you said? Yeah, there's been some real family drama, so I have, I'm not. Testing, testing. testing. This is not your first marriage. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah, like if you want to promote yeah. stuff. Oh, some people are legit, 30. some people aren't, but you can tell that they really know people. 30. Yeah, so they know and they have like one follower. Mm -hmm. What's he do? Does he get to travel or is this? 
it's all national, or is it? Well, those are what we do. Yeah. Um, a business that's not going to slow down. Traumatic event. What? Pretty traumatic event. Did you get the one I sent you? I like it. You like it? it yes, very good, actually. I'm a, I was like amazed that you did very that quickly. But then again, I'm not surprised. Are, you like gonna, are, are we going to pass this out, or do we just leave it here? Is no, no. There you, can, you can reference on that. Sure. Okay. Is there any way, do you think, that do they have a business center that we can print out here? Maybe a, do you think they can? Okay. What time does that start? In five minutes. Is there any way you can have only if she's by herself doing the act. Oh, yeah. She's, okay. well, remember, she's
Where she was like, don't, don't start without me. Yeah. No, 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 no,
Pam so Tate, to do Carolina. I wanted to know why my that friend's killer chopped her up into pieces like nothing. That's enough, right? And so that's why I went to go work for the, for, for the government. So I'm more of a profiler. And so, yeah. And so, even um, leading up to the end of the book, and like my divorce and all that stuff, it's pretty insane. So. I can ruin a portrait, like, <laughs> oh. I think you guys are going to be sharing. Oh, sharing one? And okay. then we're going to be sharing one. All right. Okay. Yes. Hi. And it's 2.30. Oh, Susan, I'm so glad to meet you. Oh, you bet, Are you going to be here the whole time? I was upstairs reading your book. Oh, really? Yeah. It's really good. Oh, thank you. I read the book. Okay. Oh, the yeah. review. Yeah, 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 I figured. I figured. I love that. Yeah. I I'm know. Really Features cool. women and my McGowan. Yeah. 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 So, Bentley, Brantley, Bentley. That one. Just to feature women. Yeah, downtown. Brentwood. Now, the fashion show is at Filmhouse, just a group. Uh, yeah. so, I have to do something. Gay. I'm on the list. Um, one of the things I'm doing this in the summer. I'm on the list. I published Bentley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I started the red and then just talk like that. I've been talking to the way she was going to make so not just the show, but translating basically also translating spouses. So the whole time I also stayed. Yeah, because that's the end of the North 30 minutes drive from here. It's good to see you. What yeah. can you see? Our can you just learn? Kind of right <laughs> can you see our <laughs> better hands? Like, and if should we push them back? Then make different. I mean, I'm, I am probably we should read these interviews, oh, oh. but I have a yeah, lot of and it's going to be so good. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. so I do something that yeah, they have the similarities, but they definitely have a lot of difference. Okay, oh, okay. I'm trying to get a national magazine. I'm a New Yorker. Together in the same yeah, picture. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I've gone back in the history, you know, to directors. So I can talk about Ida Lee King, uh, Lena Vertmuller, and I don't know several others that because I don't just write about directors. No, you should be able to put your your but no, that's not the right one. It was, but those. Hi. It is. In yeah, it's a true story of uh, come on, Jeff. Get my mom's righty, come on, here gesture of support during the Vietnam War. And she had a seven year pen pal relationship yeah. with this gentleman um, mm -hmm. who actually came to Suitable visit us on one of the stateside yeah, leaves during his seven years four tours. It, it is. And we've adapted it to stage <laughs> and eventually it's going to be filmed. So. <laughs> It's a true story. It's still, yes. still with us. My mom's still with us. And we're sitting his daughter. Here, very important panelists sitting in room E, East. And I need the freaking pen. <laughs> his daughter, who we adopted during the war, but in Korea, is still with us. So it's, it's been this amazing reunion. Um, I happened yeah. upon her letters. I started going through them with my mom because she has dementia. So it's trying to tap into her long term memory. I just read the letters. Which one was out? Riveting is the last. Right, my script. I have 77 letters just from him, and my mom had the wherewithal to kind of attach her carbon copy response to the letter, so I have a dialogue in many cases over seven years. Make it funny. So it's been compared to the discovery of Anne Frank's diary, which is two years of her writing herself during the war. This is seven years of her writing during the war. I'll try to read it. Like this is seven women in film. We've got people <laughs> from art. We've yeah. affiliated with What's that? So, on oh, yeah. so we've got people coming. Yeah. Well, he, he did. He and um, Joe Galloway but wrote that. With Nashville. Yeah. And then, I mean, my all Guardia. He actually wrote the uh, leadership is one on We Were Soldiers Once yeah, and Always. Yeah, um, But you know, the leadership and his leadership. Of a few that do in my top ten films of all time. 
Yeah, 90% of yeah, the work is done by 5%. And um, he said the they board nailed it, about 75% accurate, which is good for Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah the kill And then I death. love how, so you want to hear this great Godwin story? And I think, uh, no, I'm going to say, guess what? I was <laughs> Bill Goodman. <laughs> <laughs> you want to pull that up? Oh, should I put that up there? It's a lot of pressure. And is this supposed to start? Yeah, you got this hard cover. Yeah, what time is it? Uh, uh, Oh, well, mine's 10 minutes, but it's about 11 o'clock. Oh, it's, it's about 10 of 11, yeah. Uh, Trinity may be on. Well, that's all right. Why don't we get this done? We can talk amongst us. No, I hear you. All right, you got to do it on yeah, my phone, too. Yeah, um, there you go. We're taking pictures. I know, know right? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> hey, the guy. Can I get you? Yeah. She's a, uh, I don't want to call her a dual agent, but she, gosh, I can't remember. The name of the agency starts with C, a cute little name. But they do a lot of book representation also. And, uh, but she does both. She's, she, so we'll see what happens. Um, but she was. Stay right there. Okay, you get to take this one. I think that may be the way I'm going to approach it first is to get her name to the literary. Make your story. Create a story. That's right. That's right. Make something up. And if I could get one Have you got somebody? somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If you did it, but. I'm just going to ask uh, some questions that, that you all can listen to. Kind of old. Yeah. What is the Should meaning I of life? Should I do an outbound of my story screenplay? Okay. Just okay. start typing and see okay. where it is. Thank you. That was I like right. that. I like that. She's a writer. Yeah. I'm just finishing up. Want me to stand up again? Good. Are there any good books? I'm not going to. We may not have time for more than one question, but so the way I'm setting it up is that I'm going to introduce you just no bios. You're going to tell your bio, and I'm just going to introduce your names and then let you speak about and answer a question. Then I want to. Do you want to hop in for one of mine too? So in sure. the yeah, hop in for one of mine. If you don't want to ask questions, if they uh, want of you guys, because yeah, I must have 50 questions. And no way I can get to all those. Oh, no, you just book something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but all right, who's I sitting here? Everybody Whatever comes up is fine. So, so I got the lowly it's one. It's time. I'm like embarrassed to okay, hold it out it's anymore. It's time to start. Who's <laughs> 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 extra Seven. Well, that, that's Patricia's job. She says she's on the panel. No, I know I'm on. I'm on the other panel. Like here. Right here. I mean, I think there's one place for you. Yeah. All right. Well, you don't have to stand up. Can you guys sit down a little so that you need a little space? Which way? Yeah. Hi. I know I interview with you in the camera. Get chummy. It's good to see you. Oh, you want to see How are you? Hi, Susan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Neighbor. I've never had so many things go wrong and so many questions I can't answer. I, I, I just was telling you, Jeff, and I told him, guess what? Next year, I'm going to turn to stuff the goodie bags. Oh, perfect. Uh, I have this down now, so I'm going to do this part. But I, I gotta gotta have a number of other things. This is and nobody's here to listen. I, well, we'll just talk about it. Somebody right needs to ch chase people in here. Because all those people standing out there. Could you know what? I, I think I've seen it. It's yeah, so, so dear to me. <laughs> Brian, I can always give you the picture. 
Somebody's going to have to make a selfie stick where you can have multiple phones. Yeah, I'm. No, no, just you, me, and Kelsey. Because we're the point people. Well, no, we're not. I'm not a point person. We all know it's John Mayhew. We've got two more people. We've got two more people. My phone. Are they filling in on the times we want to go? Well, it's generalized. We just ask them to go do things. It's not as specific as we've got to it. Yeah, yeah. Film school is taking notes. It really is a Tuesday. Is that a good and I kept writing it. It's a Tuesday. It's right here. Where did everybody go? They're back here. Everybody's on the back. I'd like to start because no one ever talked to him. Well, I'm going to go outside and chase people in here. Oh, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yes. yes. Brian. Okay. <laughs> hey, Brian. <laughs> Will you go and pull some people in here? You get out of my way. Excuse me. Excuse me. And then hold your you pose, you're going to have her do one with my camera. I will, Pam, I will hold you that now. Thank you. Oh, wait, we're going to say that. We're going to say that. He's a lovely guy. He's from California. He's so supportive. Yeah. He writes a baby Thank you. He's written a magazine. It's a very popular and It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. Um, well, my mom, my dad was too old to serve. He was 30, and my siblings, my brothers, were too young. They were five and six. And she just felt like she needed to do something to support the GIs. And um, she saw a news. He went out. You get in here. You know, it's like barking outside a, a building and pulling them in off the street. Oh, wow. Well, you know, this is one of the first panels that we have yeah. and people come. So I just can't go to Texas. Just probably. Yeah. 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 But hey, you you never know. Know. we're going to. You, you never know. A lot of times people like to come to me because they like to show you. They say, I got clothes and so forth. Can you do some I know. But the question. I used to live with my husband. We used to live in Brooklyn. We had to go there in June. I'm thinking it's going to be 100 degrees. Yeah, and you know what I'm talking about? Yes. And she said, I really have to go. Yeah, I'm Carolina. I'm Carolina. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Here in California. In Central Valley? Okay. So the right thing you need to car be okay. I've watched I've spent a lot of time, well, not a lot of time, recently the last couple of years. Of course, I watched that. My daughter's out there in LA. Nice. Well, I think it's the only one she can get the car, Thank you. Everybody's all shows up here. So. Yeah. <laughs> and who's this you're talking about? Sean. I don't think. Um, I don't think it's him. She's talking. She. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe it's just a screenwriter. How to get away with okay. murder. We're, we're all in the back. Grey's Anatomy. Uh, no, no, we're all in the back. So she's a screenwriter. So this is yeah. something My else. Book. I mean, this one. Which is the Okay Bottle. It's the first book in a seven book series. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm almost done with book two, but it's. It's about like magic and adventure. And so, I would like to say so that uh, I would say I got an but award for young adults. Um, I got multiple recognitions. But thank you for young adults as well as um, yeah. middle grade. Yeah, but it's really from I did beta reading testing, so it was from eight up to ninety years. And so a lot of good read best finishes. We start. We were supposed to. We were supposed to start. We're going to start now. So. I know. We'll leave the door open, but we're going to start, and people can come in. Let's just go.
Well, we can't wait. We need to wait. Is that Kelsey? Oh, she's Patricia, here. She's Patricia, here. she's here. Patricia. Oh, you hear? There's Kelsey. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> this has been a little. I, I, I act in the moment, and I'm a little crazy. So I'm, but I am your monitor. <laughs> <laughs> and it is writing your best story. So I think it was interesting when I was asked to do this, the be the moderator for this group. I thought, oh, writing books, um, writing about yourself, and. And what I realized is it's not all about autobiographies. It is about anything that's writing. And you know, I thought I had a conversation one time with a songwriter. And he told me, he said, this song's about me. I'm writing a book right now. It's called Hello Self. This book's about me. So I'm saying that you're going to hear from some of the panelists that they're saying that what they do, their movies or whatever, their um, film writing, their stories, there's a core of them in there. And that's what really made me excited about this because it is not just about uh, writing a book. It's about everything in our lives. Every time we tell a story, whether it's written down or not, it's a piece of us. So I was really excited about that because I'm all about finding out who we are, becoming who we are. And so um, with that, I'm going, here's the way I plan to run this, e this particular panel, is that I want to have a question and answer at the end. So you can ask anything that doesn't, that you don't feel was answered here, or that you want to dig deeper in one of our panelists. So I'll leave a little bit of time for that. I'm also going to uh, give you the names of the panelists but then I'm going to ask them to go in a little bit deeper about who they are. I'm not going to read a bio. Let them tell you their bio. And we'll be asking some questions at that point, too. That they have sent in to me. So we could be here the rest of the day if you want to hang around. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. Oh, cool. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> I wouldn't. OK. In no particular order, the names of our panelists. See if you can figure out who they know. I'm just kidding. Carolina Ugas Moran. You yes. wait? Yes. yes. I wait. <laughs> Jeff Chase. Hello. <laughs> Angelica Lopez. There she is. Pam Tate. Yvette Freeman. Susan Hunter, Valerie Connolly. So the way I want to start, and I will like in no order, I'm going to start with Jeff Chase. He's there in the middle of all these. <laughs> and uh, so Jeff sent me a question. So I want him to uh, give a little bio so you'll know more about who Jeff is and what he's done. And then I'd like you to ask this question, answer this question, Jeff. Should I do an outline of my story screenplay or just start typing and see where it leads? So we'll see how Jeff approaches that. So I'll ta turn it over to you, Jeff. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, the, sh the short bio. Um, OK, I've had a number of different careers. Partner in an advertising agency, a real estate broker in Arizona for 20 years, commercial properties, industrial properties, that kind of thing. Had always written songs ever since I was 14 and decided at one point to leave everything I had in Arizona and move here in 85. Uh, worked at, full time as a songwriter in Nashville for 13 years. Um, decided I did not want to be pushing a shopping cart down Broadway when I was 60 years old. <laughs> and, uh, so I started an IT company, and I still have that, although I've walked away from most of that because I'm sort of semi-retired, but I work full-time. Um, I write screenplays, and uh, I'm a SAG actor. I still write songs, but screenplays really turned me on a number of years ago, and uh, it's a medium that I just fell in love with. I have researched it obviously a lot, uh, taken a bunch of courses that have made me a stronger writer, and that's what I'm doing now full time. 
Um, the last five scripts I've written all have recommends. That's sort of like a, the gold seal. You know, if you get a recommend on a script, you can pitch it, and the producer will go, oh, it's got a recommend. It's not from a nobody, although I'm still a nobody. Um, so at any rate, that's, that's what I'm doing. I was writing full time. Amazingly enough, um, and I, you cut me off. I'll give me a one minute warning, okay? When okay. you shut up. <laughs> um, amazingly enough. You and I enough, got the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last couple of scripts I've written, written and the one that I'm, that I'm now outlining um, all have female protagonists. Um, I don't know why. I have a, I mean, you know, I have a wonderful wife and uh, I've known a lot of women, but for some reason, the female psyche really, um, really interests me. And th this one's gonna be a psychological thriller. Um, so at any rate, that's what I do, that's what I'm doing now. Um, the question about outlining uh, is really important. Um, when I first started writing, and of course, it's different for every medium. As a songwriter, if I'm writing by myself, you, you have an idea, hey, that sounds like a cool hook, you know. The hair on her chest was his. You know, actually, a friend of mine did write that song. It's funny, <laughs> comedy, but uh, not commercial. Um, but as a songwriter, you can just sort of start strumming, or if you work co-writing, you toss ideas back and forth. It, it, you get right into it. You don't need an outline. If you're writing a long form, whether it is a play, screenplay, uh, a book, novel, whatever that medium is, um, most of the A-list writers out there will say, Yes, I always do an outline. Uh, and I'll, be, I'll address strictly screenplay, because that's my, I mean, I've written, I've, I've written one novel and I've co-written another spiritual novel, two story uh, with a guy. But screenplays are my love, and regarding screenplays, if you typically have a th three-act structure that people look for, uh, have always looked for, Aristotle, you know, been around a long time, but if you don't know what's gonna happen in your first act, your second act and your third act and have a really good idea. It's happened to me when I first started writing, you get to page 50, 55, 60 of say 110, 120 page script and all of a sudden you're floundering. And where am I, what, what am I talking about? Because your protagonist maybe is not a strong protagonist. You realize, well, this person has no goal. What, what, what is the goal? You have to have a goal in a script. You see at the beginning of the movie, protagonist has a goal of some kind to kill the terrorists and escape the high-rise building as in Die Hard or whatever it is. There's a goal that that person goes through. The antagonists put them up in a tree and throw rocks at them to make it hard to attain that goal. And in the third act, you wind up, he finds or she finds a way to achieve that goal after a lot of soul searching. And there's usually an arc, usually always has to be an arc in a great movie where they want something at the beginning they don't get that, but what they get at the end is what they need. We're into the third act right now, yep. Jeff, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Outline. Thank you. Yeah, uh, an outline. And um, so you can begin to form your questions now, and then afterwards you can have some time with uh, Jeff. Okay, Angelica will be the next one to introduce herself through her brief bio. And you know what? I'm going to take this question that you had. What was the toughest obstacle while writing? Yeah, that's, that's a great one. Hi, everyone. It's a privilege to be here. I am Angelica Robles Lopez. Um, if you've read my book, you are probably astonished at the end of it. So if you haven't, go ahead and read it. <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug there. Um, that's right. So born and raised in Chicago, I grew up in a very rough neighborhood in Chicago. And um, I worked for the government for 16 years. Um, four of those years were done undercover, and so I was pretty much a Latina minority in a male dominant world trying to survive. So I talk about that in the book, and I pretty much talk about trauma and just everything that human, humans go through. Um, I joined the Bureau after my friend was murdered and dismembered in Chicago. It was one of the most heinous crimes in Chicago history. You can look it up. Everything is online. Her name is Janet Mena. And um, I always tell people, when you go into this type of work that I do, which is uh, terrorists, drug dealers, pretty much the scum of the earth, I got to talk to um, these type of people that cut people's head off, eat people for a living, 
and just commit the most horrible crimes, including killing other people, terrorism, and all that stuff. So I got to meet all those people. Um, so that's pretty much it. I decided one day I was going to write a book about my life and all the trauma that I dealt with. And pretty much uh, this book was born in three weeks. And so to your question, for me, writing this book was a cathartic process. I wrote it in three weeks because I needed to get everything out of my system into paper. So I always tell people, when you write, you get clarity in your mind because you're getting everything out into paper. And so people think it's crazy that was three weeks, but it was a healing for me. And I literally would write from eight o'clock at night to five in the morning and then I would go walk for two hours because there was all this emotion that was being evoked that I needed to just get it out and I needed to move so that all this could just be out of me. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. I, I agree 100% <laughs> that it's really our process in, in helping us work through whatever story we're writing. Right. So, so it was the emotions that I had to deal with. Yes, so, very yeah. good. Okay, let's uh, check with Pam Tate now right here and she sent in a question what is your favorite part of the writing process outlining writing dialogue editing what is it and a little about you pam okay well i'm um i've done many things throughout the years uh, i'm an actor i've been a director i'm from new york uh, producer. I'm also a musician, which is one of the things that drew me from New York to Nashville. And uh, for a long time, I was writing songs, short form, three minutes, you know, verse, verse, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus, very formulaic, but I wrote some really good songs and made some really good CDs. Okay, so but I was injured, and I, at the time, HBO was running Sense and Sensibility, like on a loop. So, and I have always been really drawn to history, historical ideas. So I had this uh, book by Louisa May Alcott, a story that I had carried around with me for decades and always wanted somebody to adapt it so I could play the leading role. Okay, that didn't happen, and I will not be playing the leading role because I have aged out of it. But I remember starting that, uh, highlighting in the, in the book, and sitting in my foyer of my apartment writing while my husband watched the news. I had, I was cooking in the kitchen. My son was asking questions. And I felt like that woman that wrote Peyton Place in a, in a trailer and like everything was going on around her. Okay, but I love this story. And as I said, I'm really into history. All of my protagonists are females who are set in a period of time where there was a great amount of social upheaval. And watching how that translates to this female protagonist and how she, she handles it, how they, you know, what the society is like and breaking through that. So I'm working on a mini series right now based on a, that story, which I had originally written as a feature, and I have ex had to expand it greatly to put it into eight, eight episodes, which has been a lot of fun. I brought my, you know, I would say at this point that story is very loosely <laughs> inspired by that story. Okay, so I have several projects that I've written. I wrote a play that won a national award, and that was about a famous director from Germany who was called Hitler's favorite, uh, Leni Riefenstahl. I don't know if you know who she is, but I wrote a play that won a bunch of national awards and readings, but expensive and didn't get produced. Uh, several others, and I have a lot of ideas, too. Um, 
and again, mostly female based. Uh, so what is the your favorite, favorite part? part yeah. Honestly, writing dialogue. I love that. And I will kind of outline. I, I really do know where the story starts, the middle of it, and the ending. And as I start to write these characters, the whole story, I mean, I could outline the story, but I'm kind of of the Stephen King um, philosophy that you create these really strong characters and you know their background. You know where they were born. You know how they grew up, if they have brothers and sisters. And you take your strong characters and throw them into a situation and see how they react. Yeah. And many times, I mean all, every time, I have found that my characters speak to me. They lead me to these points in my story that I know must happen. So I love to write dialogue. I just feel like my characters come alive. Then I start outlining. Jeff and I are part of the Tennessee uh, Screenwriters Association, so we talk about all this stuff all the time. So you build a relationship with your character. With my, yeah. uh, totally. Okay. I need to know them, and I do. Thank you, Pam, <laughs> thank you. So you can get more detailed information, but I just want to move through, and then we'll, hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Okay, the next person I have on my list is Carolina Guaz Moran, and Here's the question that you sent me that I really like. Is a line and the blue bottle is your first novel. What inspired you to write that book? Okay, perfect, thank you. So my name, Carolina Ugas Moran. I was born in Spain, but I moved to South America. I was raised in South America, so I went from Spain to Argentina. Venezuela, Puerto Rico, not South America, but we'll count it. And then I moved to uh, Peru, and then here to the United States. And so I wanted to write, since I was eight, I started writing, and I found the power by writing a poem, and I was able to get into a school that was not allowing me to get in. So I realized by eight years old that the power of writing, what can it do to a person? So that inspired me to start writing. and I wanted to write a book, A Lean and the Blue Bottle is the first, as, as Patricia mentioned, is the first book of my seven book series. I wanted to write a book that inspired kids, um, that inspired people to really feel like there's more out there than the world that they're surrounded, that they can transform themselves to a place that is unimaginable, breaks their boundary of where they're at, and really wants them to go flip the next page to see what else is gonna happen because they're so in the book. There's so much living and breathing what is in there, but they wanna do that. They wanna be there, they wanna read it, they wanna move forward, and they wanna be transformed for the next one, and they can't wait. Because I found that in books, that did that for me. But I also wanted to bring all that traveling that I did, all the diversity and inclusion, the acceptance of different cultures, and how I moved from one place, and I was always the outcast, with a funny accent, that I had to fit in and be able to see how can I, how can I join and in a man-led society, Latin America, I was a little girl trying to be through all of that. So that's what my books are about. How can I inspire, how can I motivate, but how can I also talk about tough situations, bring culture, bring you know, the language, the, the, the depth of culture that there is in language for me is crucial, so I brought Quechua, which is an Inca language, it's 2,000 years old, that's in the book, there's Spanish, and then there's adventure. And I also wanted to have a female protagonist because why not have female leaders that are role models for kids and they're their age. And it's not about marrying Prince Charming, but it's really about showing how girls can achieve adventures, set their minds to it, move forward and fulfill their lives, regardless if they marry Prince Charming or whoever, in their lives or not. So that's the reason why I wanted to write this book. Now what inspired me in writing? 
I had two things, life and a dream. I had a dream, it was a girl, and we had amazing, amazing adventures, and I wrote that down, and that inspired me for more dreams, and I wrote all those down, sewed them together, and wrote an outline for six <laughs> books back in 2003, and really understood where my character was gonna go from beginning to end. I know exactly what's gonna happen in every book, every secret, I just have to write them. In 2015, I had to travel for work, and um, by nature or by, by education, I'm a biochemist, so I always like to bring science in here, and I'm a creative writing, so I major in both, and I work in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 plus years, so I had to work. I leave my husband and my daughters for more than 30 days. And so I decided to continue our tradition, which is rather than reading bedtime stories, we make up bedtime stories for one to two minutes, and we'll just go around the room. So I made them a 30 plus bedtime story. And I send every day a video Regardless of which country I was in, I will send them a video and I will continue the story. And when I finish, I realize oh, this is a gap in my six book outline that I was missing. So I rewrote everything. I started from scratch and it became a seven book outline. And it's what, just over and over and over. Yes. Yeah. And so it, it inspired me life. Life inspired me. My daughters continue to inspire me. But um, my, my own experience from growing up in different countries and seeing how books can transpire you with my life, put together a seven book outline that okay. I hope you enjoy. Thank you very yes. much. Okay, we could have pauses, but that'll take time. So we'll just skip it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next person on my list is Susan Hunter. And I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about her. She's a producer, a director, she's all these things. And the question, what advice do you have for women who want to write their own story? Do it. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, as far as the bio, I'm going to skip ahead to where it gets exciting and I enter this space. When I turned 50, I was putting uh, 50 years of the Northeast behind me. I was moving to Nashville and, um, and as well as I was starting a new career. And little did I know this career was actually finding me. And I, what happened was um, I had my mom living with me because she was battling dementia. And I was trying to well, keep her safe because she was trying to escape in the middle of the night. Um, and she was living up in Massachusetts. So I took her to live with me. And in trying to battle the dementia or combat the dementia, I took out some letters that I had found from um, her writing campaign she did during the Vietnam War. And it was her gesture of support for the soldiers uh, not a yay or nay for the war, it was just I want to support these troops. Many of them have just you know, graduated high school. And so I brought these letters out and reading them with her, trying to tap into her long-term memory, these letters were riveting, each one as riveting as the last. And I then said, well, mom, we need to, and she had portals of you know, recall, which were just fascinating. So I thought, okay, I'm doing good, I'm reversing dementia, which you can't do, but I was naive at the time. Um, anyway, so I sought out to find the one soldier that we had 77 letters from. Um, and in, in, in many cases, my mom had the wherewithal at that time with four children running around uh, and a husband running around <laughs> um, uh, to attach their, her carbon copy responses to the letter. So I have a dialogue in many cases. And this is seven years. He had four tours over in Vietnam, an amazing man. Uh, their conversation is frank. It's riveting. It's uh, meaty. They talk about a lot of the things that were going on, the confluence, confluence of activism going on in the United States at the time, and then the juxtaposition of that versus the combat zone that he was in in Vietnam. Um, and anyway, so it's just, long story short, we found him. And then that led to the most amazing reunion, jaw-dropping redemption, because it got his daughter involved. Anyway, so I said, okay, when, when his daughter got involved, I said, this needs to get out to the masses. And so, you know what, I green-lighted myself to go write this book. And at first I did start out, admittedly, I did start out trying to look for a co-author, but COVID hit, we are all isolated. I said, all right, you know what, I'm gonna do this. And uh, I'm isolated anyway, make the best of this, you know, this time frame. So I r grinded, I wrote the book, start to finish in eight months, and that's three different structures, because I had different mentors saying, no, write it from this point of view, no, write it from this point of view, and then finally the last, Gentleman um, comes with pretty good credentials. He was president of Paramount Pictures for most of his career, and now he was one of my mentors. And he said, uh, "Do you want to sell books? Yes. Do you want to make this a movie? Yes. 
well, then you need to be in this book. It needs to be from your point of view. And I kind of hemmed and hawed and said, ah, I don't want to you know, look like I'm trying to steal the light away from my mom and Sergeant Johnson. And he said, no, no, no. When you tell this story to people, they get chills because the story is just that riveting. You need to make sure that reader feels like they're in the kitchen with you or sitting on the top step of your porch with you hearing the story. And then you can have flashbacks and all that. So I said, OK, I'm going to do this. And uh, I'm going to do it from that point of view that he suggested. And what I did was I just devoured, uh, you know, with that green lighting yourself, you know, just don't ask for permission. Just do it. Uh, green light yourself. But with that, you also have to then have an insatiable appetite for learning. I devoured the internet, anything that was free, any YouTube video, any webinar, I jumped on and I devoured information on the internet. And then you have to have discipline. I worked every single day, more than anything. I didn't see my friends for about eight months. But you know what, I got something done. Um, and I could check that box and I it's- I think you can see that Susan lived what she just advised you. Do it if Do it, <laughs> yeah. And I'll so just- she lived her story and if you've got one, Take her advice and just start writing. Just do Somebody it. Somebody will come up and help you. Yeah, I think, who said that? Just do it. Not <laughs> just do it. Yeah, I give up. Oh, yeah, we could get in trouble there. But there will be, you can speak, uh, we can have more conversations, but I just want to move through the other panel so you get a feeling of who all's here and then who you want to talk to. So the next one is Yvette Freeman. And she's got her magazine up there, and she's a magazine publisher, but I'll let her tell you more about uh, herself and what she's done, and uh, give us some tips about how you might write your own magazine if you decide to do it. Well, I was surprised because I am the only one who is not a professional creative writer, although when I was growing up, I used to write poetry myself and try to get into screenwriting. That's creative. Yes, but... Uh, <laughs> I actually created the magazine, which is the Envoy Guide, last year during COVID because I wasn't seeing any other publications in my area that actually featured women and minorities, uh, especially that were creative artists, that were business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, so I wanted to create a magazine that featured those types of people and gave them an opportunity to promote themselves and what they're doing. And I love what everybody's doing up here, especially at this conference and at on this panel because there are so many different women who are trying to get in the creative space, who are trying to express themselves, who are trying to start businesses, and they need information. So this magazine actually provides educational tips. It also uh, has feature stories so that you can get inspired by the other women doing this. But my basic tips are basically when you are telling your story, and I tell this to everyone who is featured in my magazine, be authentic, number one. But also, when they are filling out my questionnaire, I tell them, always write as if you're speaking not, if, not only to me, but to the readers. Because I want everyone who's reading your story to hear your voice. So many people have a hard time writing, and I have always had this problem understanding why people have a hard time writing. I say, just write in complete sentences. Write what you are saying in your head. And I do tell people when they're writing stories, I said, do write an outline. What do you want to tell people in your story? What do you want to get across? And then write it out in complete sentences. For some reason, that's very hard. But write it out so that you are telling your story not only orally, but you're putting that on paper, your story. So basically, just be authentic, be honest, be straightforward to the point, but tell people what you want them to know about you. And I always say when you're writing it out, reread it, have somebody else read it, and then edit. The first draft is never the one draft that you're going to end up with, yeah. but always have someone else read it because what you think you are saying is not always what comes across. But definitely just tell your story because when people are reading this magazine, I want them to hear your, vo your voice, not my voice. And right. so. Einstein said, be a voice, not an echo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's very critical for where we are. And another thing I'd like to remind all of you that they have a display, the books that are here, that the authors that have any books or magazines, huh? they're back there on the, in the exhibit area. So you might be able to go back there and look at those too. So, okay, thank you, Yvette. And last but not least, Valerie Connolly, who is also <coughs> a member of Women in Film and Television here in Nashville, screenwriter, producer, and everything. I'll let her tell you um, anything that 
she wants to tell you about and any advice she wants to give you about all the things that she has done <laughs> and next steps for her. Yes. Hi. Don't outline. Let it come through. You are a vessel. Hallelujah. <laughs> Rock and roll. If you outline it, you'll discover that the cosmos will take you away from your outline and that will cause stress. So just do your story. If you feel you need to reorganize it later, sure, but let it flow through you. And I know this because as a singer songwriter, as a, com a serious composer, as a playwright, as a novelist, and I've published 230 books as a book publisher for people all over the world and all over the United States, writing has been a part of my thing. And I did all the editing with those people and did all the layout and design for those people and worked with Ingram Book Company here in Tennessee to get them a global audience. So I, I have gone very far, 16 years of doing book publishing with all those wonderful people. And my own books, I've written three books uh, sorry, six books, three novels, and some children's books, and some how-to books. And I'm a poet because I'm a lyricist for songs, mm -hmm. and I'm a screen, a playwright. And from a play that I wrote and staged uh, back in 19, no, 18, 1822, <laughs> 2016. <laughs> um, okay. It's been a crazy morning. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, I have now come into what I really wanted to do in the first place, because as a child, out in the yard, we're all playing, and we're making up stuff and having cowboys and Indians and all that stuff. I was standing there like this, taking the movie. Yeah. And I never realized it until I had a chance to make a movie out of my screen, out of my play. And when I made that movie, learned how to make a movie, editing, et syncing music to, oh my God, the syncing issues were incredible. But <laughs> learned how to do all of that. And I realized that the story wasn't a stage play. It was a movie. And so then I said, what kind of movie is this going to be? It's a musical movie because it was a musical stage play. And it had a ghost, but I wanted more than that. So I said, I love sci-fi. So let's make a sci-fi musical. And that's what I've done. It has been a long, long road. And tell me about rewriting. <laughs> I'm on the 45th iteration of this screenplay. And I'm working with a fellow who is what they call a, uh, a feature film analyst. And he works, he has spent his life working on set with guys like Spielberg and Scorsese and Dennis Quaid and all these guys. And I get to talk to him every three or four weeks about every iteration that I'm writing for him. And he turned this, he turned me into a screenwriter. And now my protagonist isn't just a ghost. She's a human, but she's really an alien, and there's this whole big story. And I can't tell you all of that now because right, it would eat up the time. <laughs> but see, the see. writing process never ends, and you're never satisfied, and you always want to make another change. And it's like the painter who put the one daub of paint on that they should mm -hmm. never have put on that painting. You have to know when to quit. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to have good advice about that. And that's why having someone who mentors you, and you've all had mentors of some sort, it is a very, very important part of the game. And as a screenwriter and, and as a producer of this, who's going to produce my movie but me? I'm a woman. My, my character is a woman protagonist. We have to get out there and do all the work. Right. And, and it's a very, very, I thought I was climbing Everest. No, no, I was in the foothills. <laughs> And now I'm in, now I'm climbing I'm I'm climbing Everest trying to fund it and and get everybody together, and Jeff Cook back there he's my underscoring for this thing and we we have uh, known each other for years and he brought me uh, uh, Andy Hill and Andy Hill was the reason we had the Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and all that. He loves my music. He's going to be my music supervisor for my film. We're going to have a wonderful team. And a musical sci-fi film is such a strange character, but we have to bring it, we have to bring the musical genre into this, into where we are. We're a quarter century into the 21st century and we have nothing but history and regurgitation right. of the same old thing. So don't regurgitate, be creative, yes. completely new story, make sure you're in that story. My character has a lot of me in her 
and she's terrified to be a superhero, and she learns how. And that's what women have to do, right? We have to learn how. And uh, love is dot, dot, dot. I have I, cards if you want them, I and I'll let you. I was wondering if you were going to get to I got to do that. Oh, I I, is love it? is. And it's a love story. It's three love stories mixed up with a alien invasion. So <laughs> <laughs> I got cards if you want them. I'll be happy to hand them out. So that's the voice from our panel. Does anybody <coughs> have questions that they would like to ask? <coughs> yes, right here. Uh, I constantly research, yeah. constantly. If I have my character uh, put on a dress, I want to know what that dress is. I want to know what it looks like. If she's in a music hall, I find paintings of music halls. Uh, when I, the period I'm working on right now, um, Rembrandt was painting portraits of, our, of actresses. Okay, so I find these portraits. I, I get so much from those. Everything I do, I research. I try to make it as authentic as possible. I, I go on and I say, okay, what events, I mean, I Google, what events happened in England during 1877? Well, the first Wimbledon <laughs> in 1877, where 250, of the highest class are dressed in evening clothes, standing in a really hot day. They have no bleachers. They're standing there behind a rope watching the first Wimbledon. And I have the character say, I wonder if they'll ever do it again. <laughs> what she's saying is you have to walk with that person a little while, actually get there, and not just stand outside the perspective and give your own perspective. You've got to be in there. You have okay, to have good. that world. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, Angelica, you must have been about 18 or 19 when 9 11 happened. Mm -hmm. Was that a factor in your decision to work for the FBI? Um, yes and no. At the time, I was at University of Illinois Champaign, and I was actually in ROTC for Air Force. And you're not going to believe this. That morning, my alarm clock didn't go off, so I actually missed. Uh, morning, morning uh, a workout and uh, I remember waking up and I just slept in and everybody was just running crazy and I think um, I would say yes because they were they what they told us to do was don't wear your uniform because they were afraid that all us ROTCs were gonna be going to war and so at that point I think I was more terrified than anything but I was ready if, if I needed to go, I was going to go. So I would say probably yes. But that's a great question. I, I've never had right. that been asked. So yeah. I would say yes. Put you in, right in there, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, indirect, indirectly, for yeah. sure, yeah. OK, any other? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Anything else? No? OK. Do we have a round of applause for the <laughs> <laughs> It's just the chance to get it out there, maybe even refine it sometimes. Because remember, that's what this is about, is telling your story. And so they get a chance to tell their story because of people like you that want to learn and listen and give them an audience. So thank you so much.
much, number one, for being at our conference, and number two, for coming in here. And I want to say one more promotion piece for Patricia Leonard. Um, I will be moderating the uh, Reinventing Yourself uh, panel. And I listened down through here, and almost everybody was reinventing themselves as they went through their present, whether it was a screenplay, whether it was finding out who they were in writing their book or a magazine, we're always telling our story and discovering who we are. And I hope today you found another part of yourself. Thank you so much for being here. How about a round of applause for Patricia? Nice job. Yes. Yeah. Applause for Patricia. Applause. Thank you. Thank you. Next panel's coming in here. Another panel. Yep. Music. Yes, well, I'm going to take my water. But I'm going to take my water. Just yeah. 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 I learned yeah. more about yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I learned about everybody. Yeah, it was good. And uh, we'll see you next Wednesday, maybe. Yeah. Are you still working? Oh, no. That's so nice. Yeah. That's just yeah. Yeah. Next I hope, weekend, I hope so. that all goes smoothly. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, there's been a big family drama about it. Thank you for your The president. Yeah, that's not a good way to end America. If you want to, you can come on to see and see what it's like. And we do it every Wednesday from 7 to 6. Thank you. No, it's all good. You can see it really easy. And I will be here to warm up that story. And then it's usually a brief walk. Yeah. We're hosting a docu-series on Vietnam veterans. Actually, all you have to read my book. Because anything you could possibly think of, things that are uncomfortable to speak of, I wrote in a book. Like, I had a sister.
I just, you know, I really worked hard on my wife. I've always loved screenwriting. When I first did that story, that just wet my appetite. I went back to college. I had not gotten my BA, although I'd always planned to. I went back to college. I got a degree in film studies and screenwriting. And, you know, I just, lately, for the last year, I have just gone with this one particular uh, story. And I have a few. I have some from my family. Are you trying to figure out where you're going? A sheriff. Me too. That was in my family. Oh, Everybody I'm hated. I'm and when he finally I'm got killed in his The whole town was rejoicing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's going to make a screenplay. But I think the idea is pretty cool. I'm writing a script right now because he's going to get It's kind of cool. We'll see if I have to burn any time. I'm going to do it, but it's not really easy. I'm on the licensing side. So we met, I don't know what we were up to, that was a few years back. Yeah. Same thing. I just related to yeah. what's yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's okay. Are you from Nashville? Uh, I'm a military vet. Are you sure I'll see you here now? Yes. Oh, cool. For You're how long? Uh, <laughs> for a while. I, I go to school here. I forgot to going to do something with the last Academy. night. Yeah. 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 Coming out of town, I was like, oh it my God. Starts <laughs> <in August. laughs> it starts in August. None of that stuff's in the book. We are producing oh. a short film. I already oh. got one. It's a really 30 minute yeah. film because I'm writing it. I have that. Right. And yeah. we're going to have so are you, are you professionals in each or? of the what main. I did like selecting the last. I'm a sorry. Hi. How are you? And back in the day, I was head of writing. Good. I want to talk to you. I'm here. And then okay. University. So I made it. So, okay. so okay. that's where I had. So I still do. Uh, so I still get lots of indie yeah. producers come to me and ask me to do music. Like there was this is part of this world. You know, the chorus is to film festival. I'm doing a couple of events. Oh, yeah. Well, I got to show you this. I got to see you. Oh, I, I liked the. Huh? I said 
didn't I'm know Dave. why they yeah, did that. Hey, nice I, I liked the inner. So, so so Dave, what are you doing? Uh, I was just I was just telling Margie that uh, it's going we, to be <laughs> we met each other at Lady's yeah, Jazz Club so a long time awesome. back and uh, Margie did this and I and I used to work out in LA for Capitol and Warner Chapel and all that. But I've been uh, teaching at my day because I teach at for 18 years oh, there, so cool. I teach uh, music production, songwriting, and so why I'm here is you know, just do a lot of writing and Placing and all that, Every, like everyone else in Nashville. So <laughs> I'm not sure what entitled me to be here, but <laughs> yeah. How about yourself? Um, I mean, I was a composer for a long time. Okay, cool. Film, TV. Yeah. Were you were you out on the West Coast? Or were you? I was in LA. Okay, yeah. So what years were you there? Oh, wow. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Do you guys specialize in any styles or your own labels? Yeah. Really? I mean, we have, like, uh, we have a burlesque exactly. song band. <laughs> nice. We have a, uh, a lot of country acts, of course, in yeah. Nashville. I've got another label that's like hip hop. Okay. Um, cool. I, I'm kind of a chameleon. That's okay. Like a, like a yeah. Nice. So. What about you, Jeff? Uh, composer for John C. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. And you're based here, mm -hmm. yep. which is nice to know, you know, yeah, that this place is growing and you can still live here and have a career. Yeah. Well, I've been doing it here for like 25 years. Okay, great. Yeah. That's great. That's back, back when I started, nobody said you can't do it. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I know two, two so composers here. here. Yeah. Uh, and one was my first boss at TV. He pulled me into TV at Steve Dorse. No. So I just did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one that got started with TV. Okay. I was his music editor. I mean, it happened with him in 2001. Okay. It's the first CD gig I ever did. Was okay. Like, he's like, you want to do TV? Just gotta I'm fuck like, it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been doing records. I'm like, okay, I'll try. Get it figured out. Um, and then it was kind of kicked off from there. Okay. But, um, How long have you done it? And then, um, um, oh, years uh, actually, but I knew her socially. Uh, well, I've known her, I guess. Uh, I guess we've been happens, years yeah. as long as I've known you right now. Matt Mahaffey. Nice. They were in a band called Self. Okay. And he and Chris James used to be a good friend of mine. Okay. But they were also out in LA. But they were. Yeah, Matt moved to what a few years back because he was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scoring. He's a great musician. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
the panel on music and film and TV. We have six experts here in various aspects of the music industry um, and how it relates to the film and TV. So I want to go ahead and just give you a brief introduction on each person. We'll start down on the far right of me. It's Mo Lochran. Mo's the owner of a company called Nashville Creative House. And she is an artist. She's a songwriter, producer. She does vocal coaching and, and, and production also. She's extremely talented. And one of her main projects in the past few years has been coaching various artists, various ages, um, for the different kinds of TV shows that you all are very familiar with. The Voice, American Idol, um, Songland, A AGT, and Broadway recently. So um, she'll have a lot of different things that she can tell you if you're interested in that aspect. Liz, no. It's Margie. Margie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. Margie, Margie, Margie Evans is uh, the owner of a company here right now in Nashville called Do Right Music. Uh, she has had a, a lifetime experience in doing music publishing, as in music publishing, but also her expert field is in the rights clearance. So. Uh, she has worked for over 10 years or, uh, with the Polygram Film Entertainment, Universal Films in London. She lived, uh, worked in California. Uh, all the things that have to be done to legally get a song into any type of broadcast, Margie knows how to do that. So we'll get some aspects on that. The third person is Liz Rogers. Liz is here in Nashville and started her own company called Anacrusis Music, she's, uh, which is part of Cobalt Music. And her features, her, her concentration is more on finding those great artists, artists, songwriters, and helping get their material into film and TV and a lot of advertising. So um, she's also a publisher, so definitely works with these artists and does song, songwriting camps. And that then will help get those songs into her publishing company, too. Next, we have um, Jeff Cock. We say Cook. Well, I'll take it. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Cook? <laughs> say it again. We say, we say cook. It's cook. German. No, it's it's cook. coke. Nobody can say that cook. here. I okay. gave up in first grade insisting on that. So Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. He's a veteran film, TV, planetarium, and media composer and producer with hundreds of credits over the last 25 years. Um, Jeff is also uh, very active here in Nashville with the Filmcom as a Filmcom board member and president of the Nashville Composers Association. He is a keyboardist and in the past has been a keyboardist for Little Anthony and the Imperials, Laurie Morgan, Restless Heart, and the Glenn Miller Orchestra, which is a great variety of people. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being here. Next is Dave Tuff, yeah. <laughs> and we have Dave here from Belmont University. He is a full professor of the audio engineering technology there. Um, he's written over 500 songs for film, TV, video, and ad placements that are in major shows, like currently, New Amsterdam, um, The American Horror Story, and, <laughs> lots of <laughs> and, and many, many others. He's a recipient of two covenant uh, awards, which are Canadian Dove, and has written a lot of articles also on hit songwriting. Welcome, Dave. And Brett Boyette, sitting right next to me, uh, is also into uh, many, many things. He's a composer, he's a songwriter, 
multi-instrumentalist, a music producer of hundreds of songs that have been in film and TV and recorded by artists. Um, he is a, a executive music producer and a composer and he works with a lot of, of um, artists here as well as in other places. He lived in California for a while. He's was part of, um, was doing the production and composing for a show called Forever My Girl, which was released in 2018 uh, with Lionsgate. And Brett happened to write and produce 14 of the songs in the show. So <laughs> very, very, very talented. But in addition to all this work he does as writing and producing, he is now part of a new band called the Nashvillians. And uh, they're based here with two other writers, Troy Johnson and Scott Lindsay. And it's a wonderful sound. It's, it's uh, dark cinematic, you know, great for the Yellowstone and all these Westerns that are becoming very, very popular. So they're touring as well as they have just now released their first EP. So look them up, Nash Villians. It's, it's a great, great album. I love it. I want to start today um, and ask various questions that um, I think would be interesting for people in various aspects of the music industry. Um, we have what, what on this panel, people that actually compose the music, either as a, a, a major uh, you know, composer, but also write single songs uh, that are recorded by artists. So we have people on the panel that work with artists to um, perfect their career, their voices to be able to get them into the broadcasting <laughs> world. And, and then we have the person that's an expert on how, to sh how do we get these songs legally into the film and TV and advertising, and that's very, very important because contract work has to be perfect. You do not want to have a copyright infringement. That is the, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you in this creative world. So there are a lot of questions, and I'll, I'll just open up a few and let different ones uh, to discuss. First of all, I guess we would talk with about the song itself, and to a couple of the composers here, I was wondering if you could tell me, like, how early was it when, how early is it when you were brought into a film or TV show as a composer, producer, um, how, and then is, when you're working on it, are you working closely daily with the uh, directors and the showrunners, um, of that particular film, or do they leave you alone and let you have your own creative time and then gather back, you know, later? How's the process? And it can be any one of you, Jeff, Dave, or I'll, Brett. I guess, yeah, I guess. I'll jump in after you, go ahead. Okay, I, I guess I can start. So as a, as a composer for a feature film, usually we're brought in later in the process when the, the uh, producers and the directors start to think about post-production. Usually, don't, they're not thinking much about that on the front end, probably because they've got a zillion other things to think about. Um, but occasionally, it does, that happens. So most of the time, it's, it's as they start getting post-production, they start uh, interviewing composers and looking at people. And um, yeah, that's generally, that's what it works. And uh, the other part, oh, who do we work with? Um, usually, it's the director. For me, it's usually the, di the director. So I'm usually uh, bouncing creative ideas off. Usually, the director has most of the ideas. Sometimes, the producers will ask to review things. But most of the time, it's the director. Because usually the, the producers have hired the director to provide the creative vision, and they uh, will go with whatever he says. So that's generally, or she. Or she, yes, there, 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 been, there are some of those, yes, uh-huh. Um, so that's usually how it works for me. And um, for TV projects, it's usually a little bit different. Um, usually if it's going to be a series, I'll be brought in at before the first episode is, is um, produced. So it's a little bit different. And of course, TV deadlines are insane as well, usually. So different way of working. Um, film is a lot more creative, creatively satisfying for me. I was gonna, I'll be quick. For me, it's uh, 24 to 48 hours, and we need it, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. 
I usually talk to the editor or usually a middleman, sometimes publisher, whatever. But it's quick turnaround. It's like the last thing they think about. Mm -hmm. So I'd say in uh, film for score. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely speaking with the director. Uh, that's the person in charge of all the creative decisions of what's going to be on on screen. Uh, but you're working with the picture editor as well because they've temped everything with the picture editor, but they've been working with the director. So it's really the director. Um, and in TV, it becomes more the producers, in my opinion, or in my experience, um, that you're working with. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really, <laughs> that's, it. that's it. Okay. Um, then I want to talk about the actual artists that are going to be coming into this um, scenario of film, TV, and advertising. As a um, uh, owner of an artist-focused and artist-driven music placement company, uh, Liz, what are the key requirements for signing an artist to your company? What are you looking for? Um, yeah, so we, uh, I can definitely answer that. I don't know how helpful this is given the like current audience. I think it's a lot of like filmmakers instead of artists, but we definitely uh, try to try to find artists that have their their own authentic style that is um, new and fresh in a way that uh, can fit within the visual medium. So. Artists who are really story driven are often not going to be as applicable because the story is already being told by someone else. Um, so we look a lot more for like mood and feel and production and things that um, are captivating in different ways, um, emotional um, storytelling that's not lyrical storytelling. Um, I also, perhaps some of you have also done this, um, I also supervise a handful of projects and as a supervisor, we look for similar things either when we're hiring a composer, someone who has their authentic sound, um, but also whether we're licensing songs for the project, it's trying to find, of course, like the director's vision, but also finding artists that have, you know, something unique that they're saying as well with their music. Okay. Um, and Mo, I wanted to uh, have you talk about what it is like for you when you find artists to, uh, to take vocal co lessons with you, or is there some type of criteria in order to work with you? Um, how, how does that situation evolve from actually having a student as a, just a vocal coach and for you to see the talent that you think could then lead you to coach them before being um, on The Voice or American Idol or any of those other types of shows. What is your process? My process is um, the bar is here and everybody tries to go here. So if you find somebody, I mean, everybody on this panel knows the bar is here. You cannot go below the bar. If you try to go below the bar, try to make below the bar production, below the bar singing, below the bar execution, it's not gonna fly. You're not going to get success out of it. It's only going to be mediocre. There's a bunch of mediocre. There's not a bunch of great. There's very few people that are great. So when you hear something that has like the diamond and the rough kind of a situation where you hear like the potential of them, you know that they can rise to be great if they have the one thing that like most people are missing, which is work ethic. If you have work ethic, you can. Work ethic and perseverance suppress or surpass talent for me beyond anything else. I've found talented people, out, I mean, everybody on this panel probably has heard talented people, but they don't have the perseverance. And as filmmakers or as artists, or if you're trying to find that person that's gonna help give you the bump to get your picture up, you have to find somebody that's a worker that is not gonna sit there on their laurels or their talent. There's a ton of talented people but there's not a lot of working, persevering people out there. And so that's, the, that's a bigger criteria for the candidates that I've taken and make relationships with producers. And producers are like, okay, I need somebody that's got the tenacity to, the shows are hard. There's another person in this room that's worked on the shows. And, uh, and they, they know that it takes a certain grit, just like everybody here has had to 
push through things. So that's the biggest thing for me is that it's like you have to be talented, but you have to have the work ethic and you have to have the tenacity to keep pushing. On an average, how long do you work with them to actually get them to that point? So auditions, for the, the voice was doing it twice a year, and we would send them, we would prep them for the private auditions, which means they have to redo a cover. So, which also is good for film, because it's something that's you know familiar to the audience. So it's how do you rework a cover in that artist genre? How do you work it? One of the girls, and sometimes they select them, so one of the producers for The Voice selected an iconic song, and I was like, there's no way. And then we had this, it's a puzzle. And it was Whitney Houston's How Will I Know? And it's like, how do you have that moment? Got some great advice from some people. And it's like, how do you have that moment that lets it be theirs, but yet pays homage to such, I mean, that there's never going to be another voice like that. There's never going to be. And if you, you can try and copy it, but, I mean, it's a copy. So you have to really puzzle fix it. Um, to be able to get into that space, like with anything, like the the when you're talking about mood and vibe, it's like how does how does the palette, if it's yellow, okay, it's got to stay in the family of yellow. How do I make it a little bit more gold? How do I make it a little bit more pale, so it fits? Because the music has to bend the picture. Um, how do I make it still like if the director or the producer or the music supervisor loves the artist and loves the feel of the artist, how do you bend it to picture, but stay in the palette? So it takes, sometimes it's short, sometimes, I mean, it's, it also is like, how hard are you going to work for it? If you work hard for it, then it's not as much time. Okay, thank you. I want to get Margie to talk a little bit about the seriousness of licensing. <laughs> And um, if you could just explain some of that, uh, the contract work that's necessary, uh, and maybe what the difference is with just like a, a single song that you have to, to put in. Or well, I'll, I think the best, I work on a lot of different things. Like right now I'm clearing music for a concert that's going out Memorial Day. So I have to go clear all the songs that the artists are singing live. I'm also working on a, independent film that's using recordings and songs, so I have to clear both the recording and the song to be used in a dramatic scene, which means that um, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder because you have to mostly get approval from the actual songwriter. Like They probably don't, may not want a song of theirs in a porn movie, right? That's why you, if for sync licensing, you always have to get approval because otherwise, you know, you could have Imagine, the song Imagine in a porn movie, it's just not going to happen. So, um, that's, the, and that's the reason why you always need um, permission. Um, I've worked as music, I worked as music supervisor on the Marty Stewart show for six or seven years, so I cleared every song. They like to do parodies. So then I had to go and submit the new lyrics to the publisher, I had to get the writer to agree or not agree to whether they wanted their song parodied in that way. So that's another area that you're going to have to watch out for. Um, so every time I see that on a TV show, I go, oh, I wonder what they had to pay to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, some clients like Tyler Childers and Old Crow Medicine Show that write their own stuff and own their own recordings in a large part. They're really easy to get placements on because it's a one-stop they just have to come to me and that's it. Uh, Blackberry Smoke did a lot of stuff on Yellowstone. So um, they also own all their writing and publish, all their masters in publishing. So that's, those are the areas that you have to have covered if, you're, if you want to use music in your film. One of the things as a supervisor that I've kind of incorporated and I've seen a lot when we're pitching is um, attempting to kind of have pre-cleared folders. So you go, kind of go out with, hey, we're looking for these genre buckets, these mood tones, whatever that is, and um, we want to have an upfront understanding of about how much is this going to cost so that then when you're kind of puzzle piecing things together, you can say, hey, we can do a high budget, like an expensive song here, if we can do two smaller, cheaper songs here, or maybe we can do three medium songs here, you know, and then you can kind of temp those in 
with a bit more understanding on the front end before you then have to go. But the bigger songs are going to, you'll see MFN, Most Favored Nation. So that means that every song, if every song in the TV show is getting $5,000 just for, you know, pulling a a figure out, then unless, unless, but sometimes, you know, the producer's daughter has a song. So she puts a song in there, but hers is not Most Favored Nations, but dad's got her her song in, in there. Also, the opening and closing credits are usually double the fee for something that's used incidentally in the movie. Okay. For the uh, composers, and um, Brett also, um, would you just describe one of your projects that, that you had the, the best experience with and why? Sure. I mean, when, when I was doing uh, Forever My Girl, as a good example, um, that was a really, a, a very interesting project because I started with the script and the director. And uh, normally, like these guys said, it would be post-production. We wouldn't even start for a while. Um, but the director came to me because she had heard some of my songs in the past, and she's like, hey, I want you to write songs for this movie. And I was like, and, she, and the, the movie was not even greenlit yet. So I took the script and I wrote like, probably 20 songs to the script to different sections that I thought would be important sections. Of course, I always started off with the end credit song and the main title song because she, like what she said, it's worth more money. <laughs> that's the, I mean, that, that's, this is a job, right? So, <clears throat> um, yeah, that's, uh, so that, that was an interesting thing. And we actually presented the script to the production company and I brought some musicians in, and we performed the songs with the script to the, to the uh, production company, and they, were, they greenlit it right there. So, and then I, got, I had to re-audition for the job as composer, because there was a lot of other people. Just because I was the songwriter didn't mean I was going to be the composer. So, because it's a whole different animal, as these guys will stay, I'm sure. So I had to re-audition for that, and uh, I got the gig doing that and worked very close with the director. Um, Sometimes the directors are really involved, and sometimes they're less involved, uh, but usually they're really involved. And sometimes that can not be a great thing, but as a composer, we have to do what they, you know, the idea is not to do what we want. Uh, The idea is to do what, in my opinion, do what is in their head, uh, and what they're attempting with. Because they already have an idea of the tone and the idea of the uh, score that they want from the. They've already been working with the picture editor on temping. You all know what that means, temping, mm-hmm. and, and just temping the the movie with different score with, uh, from other movies and things like that. So to get the idea, so it, it's a good runway map for us on what to know and to know what what instrumentation to use, what feel to use, um, you know, what emotional context they're going with for that. So that was yeah. yeah. Great. Cool. I'll jump in. Uh, like I said, I mean, most of ninety percent of what I do are songs, producing slash composing. It's all kind of together for me. Um, I was thinking of kind of my most exciting moment was the question was back in I guess two thousand nine. I got a uh, really long and, and length matters too, right? With cue sheets, I got a really long song in a, a Seth Rogen movie, Observe and Report, <laughs> and I'm still seeing royalties, you know, international from that, even though it's you know it's like again. Do I agree with the movie's content? I, I'm all right with it. So, but um, the biggest thing I'm going to echo a couple points here, and then it, I think it ties back. So the first thing I always think about with my catalog, since I'm composing and things, are like they mentioned, some character, some uniqueness, right? Because there's so much stuff in the marketplace. You want to have a unique voice, and I will say, being in Nashville, sometimes that's hindered because the whole Nashville machine wants to homogenize everything. So it's almost exactly the opposite of what you need to do in sync. Now it's getting better over the years. But literally, you hire Joe Bob to come play guitar, and he's played on country sessions all day, and you're probably going to get it to sound like country sessions. So um, just so, first of all, bringing a unique piece to the table. Um, And that's hard sometimes because, again, they want it to kind of sound in this wheelhouse, but it's got to be unique. So um, that's one thing. Um, The other thing I do, and again, I don't know if Margie would agree with this or disagree, but with the people I write with, I, I will not write with them unless I have an agency agreement with them. And that's a very limited power of attorney that says if I get a non-exclusive opportunity, I can sign on your behalf and you can sign on my behalf on a non-exclusive opportunity. 
and therefore it's a one-stop shop. And you that's sign that every time. Every time. Every time I write with somebody. Really? Yeah, well, that I write with that I cl- cool. because what literally with that. with co- well, I mean, and, and it really it, COVID Smart. COVID reinforced it where I had a couple co-writers that I collaborated with die, and so it's like then I have to track down their heirs and educate them on the music business, and they're like, yeah, you're trying to screw me and da 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 da, and I just need to get this cleared, you know. So I always do the agency. But so anyway, um, that particular placement was through, uh, I always, almost always have middle people in LA. I just find for myself, I can't do the business. And that's a whole nother thing out there, the schmoozing and the business and all of that. So that one I got through uh, Crucial Music and Tondi, and uh, she's awesome uh, at Crucial. But I have other middle people out there that I work with that I'm happy to get publishing away to if they give me a cut. So that's the story on that. All right, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. The, so your question was what was the most uh, memorable thing? Or yeah, play? a real a memorable, in, the, what, something that you really loved being involved with and oh, how, okay. how it was set up and well, that took could place. Be, uh, okay, well, let me give you two perspectives, one from when I first started and one very recent. So the very first TV, actually the very first scoring project I ever did was actually a pretty big deal. There was a, a series on A&E, it was a primetime show called Foot Soldier, and it was hosted by Richard Karn. No, he is, uh, remember Home Improvement? Mm-hmm. He played Al in Home Improvement. Yeah. So it was right on the heels of Home Improvement when this thing came out. And a and a, a primetime slot a and was a pretty big deal. So anyway, I, I didn't quite know how what a big deal this was. But anyway, so um, I, I, uh, it was kind of a goofy show about, uh, come on, real history about uh, foot soldiers throughout history, but done in kind of a Monty Python kind of way. It was kind of a goofy thing. But anyway, so I, I, I scored the, the first show and I had a lot of time to do it for some reason. And they loved it. And the next thing I know, I'm doing the whole series. And that was like, um, and then, then, and then, the, the, then the deadlines got really tight. Um, and um, but that kind of launched things for me. And the producers for that show were working on other shows. And so the next thing I know, they're they're grabbing me for this show over here on History Channel, this show for uh, National Geographic. And so I was just like, I I barely had any time to do anything else, which was a good problem to have. Um, that's kind of how I got started with it, was by doing. Um, what they asked me to with this goofy thing. Um, and then uh, the project I'm just finishing up now is season two of a kid's show. It's called Studio 316. And um, and this one, when they kind of interviewed me for it or had me audition for it, they said, you know, what's your your creative approach to a kid's show? Because I don't really, haven't really done much in the kid's world. And I was, t- I was telling these guys that, you know, I grew up on Sesame Street, an electric company, you know, that. And the music on those shows was, was actually pretty hip. You know, like a, Herbie Hancock was on, uh, Stevie Wonder was on. So I said, we need to uh, not dumb this down and keep it pretty hip to what kids are doing today. And so we're doing a lot of hip hop stuff and they love it. So, um, I don't know, just kind of a little couple bookends. So fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say too, uh, just um, another thing is, I think it's really important for, if, if you, as a composer, if you can get the trust of that director if you end up, the director ends up loving your stuff like he did with you, you know, with you. I mean, they usually take you to every project that they get. So, because you know, they don't want to have to take a chance on somebody else. Because it, it's, you know, it's always a chance when you try somebody new. Liz, I, I was interested in in some of the experience you've had with having songs from your artist um, put into the ad. Can you? Because that's sure. so different. We've been yeah. focused more on TV and film, but advertising is a whole new world. It is. And if you could talk about the upfront fees or back end, how you receive money, or what happens with the artist, the writer itself. Yeah, from more of like the financial side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, TV shows, film, everything kind of has uh, the upfront fee where you're paying the license fee to use the song, and then there's back end royalties. Um, with advertising, you also get a couple other additional, I mean, you can probably talk to this much more, but <laughs> um, you have uh, different union fees and different things that kind of go into the ad, um, ad world. Um, but from a cre- creative place, it's actually um, a really fun world to work in when we're working with the brand executives because we're, similarly to how you're helping tell their stories, we're like working with you know, an executive at Google or at Target or at Apple to kind of shape what the sound is for the upcoming campaign or the upcoming season or upcoming product release. Um, so there's a lot more, I think, 
fun that goes in from an artist standpoint of um, creating the song and you know we're making sure things like union fees and things like pre-clearance and everything's like all squared away before it moves forward um, but do you want to jump in on any of the well, the I mean, I, I, in my present incarnation, I don't have anything to do with uh, the guilds, as they call them in Hollywood, yeah. but um, when I worked at Polygram Films and Universal Films, yes, we had, you know, but it, everything was cleared with the, they had, a all the well, studio had an agreement in place with the guilds to start with. Um, I've done some stuff, um, online streaming for us, CMA had, because they wanted to stream their awards, I did have to deal with the guilds and get an agreement for this, you know, the new media. But there's already a, a, a fee structure in place for new media, so that's, you know, it's, pr it's pretty set with the unions and what they're charging. It's not like it's negotiable. <laughs> yeah, one of the things we did find was uh, that we take into consideration when we're working in that space is um, the amount of vocal tracks. So SAG is paying like per vocal track. So if you have a really thick, like a choir or stacked vocals, they're paying for every single one of those tracks. Um, so sometimes it's important to have an alt version that doesn't have as much stacked in there um, or y ways that you can kind of separate it out if their budget doesn't allow for like the full choir bridge, <laughs> um, things like that. Well, it's funny, I was talking to a producer yesterday and this is similar to that. They were saying that they now have to remix songs. So if they have a horn section, but on screen is only one horn player, they have to remix yes. it so there's only one horn on the track. Mm. So. Hey, yeah. in, that, in that choir situation, what if it's <laughs> one person doing every voice in the choir? It's still multiple tracks. It's by track. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we had um, we had a writer who did all their own BGVs, mm -hmm. like the artists, and it was still like six tracks. Mm. Um, so they were like, hey, is there any, can you pull out, like we don't need, we don't need like that kind of thickness. And <laughs> um, so, and then another, another case was we had, um, the producer had actually sampled his own vocal to make a really cool, like he basically did like a roll, 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 and then like, like it made it into a, a sample. Um, and it was just audible enough that it was a vocal that they were like, hey, is this a track? And we have to pay for that track as well. Um, so, yeah. So are you pitching the actual songs that the songwriter that's working with you uh, has written, or are you getting information and writing the song just to a specific type of ad? Um, it's a little bit of both. So okay. we, um, about uh, maybe 50-50, but maybe 60-40 on some days, is um, outward initiation of songs that we already have, um, that we're finding opportunities for, we're reaching out to brands, we're reaching out to films, um, and then the rest of the time it's incoming requests, so sometimes that turnaround allows for our writers to, to write something specific. Um, we have big quarterly retreats where we're specifically flying in brand executives and film directors to help craft things for their projects. Um, and then the rest of the time when we get those incoming requests, we, we kind of dig within our artists and our catalog to send something back. Okay, thank you so much, that helps. Um, Mo, do you wanna go into some detail with uh, actual uh, work that you're doing with your, your artist as far as the t quality or the type of sound or genre that you have found is the best for getting them into actual TV shows? Are you choosing? That's like tricky. I think you have to be authentic because if you're not authentic, they're not gonna buy it. Because if I'm telling you, you know, if, if I'm trying to sell you a rap track, it's not gonna work because I can't do, I wish, but I can't do that, so that's not going to happen. But if I if I'm working with somebody that does Americana, I'm working I'm working I work with a lot of different producers and publishers, um, and agents in town and and labels in town, and we're trying always to have you be that color palette's important. If you're yellow, if you're pink, if you're blue, you know, stay in your palette if you can, and make that the best blue that you can be or the best yellow you can be and the if it if it's a one-off it still has to have part of that original color in there mm -hmm. 
because if it doesn't have that original thread in there, then nobody's gonna gonna. It's not gonna benefit the artist. It's might it might be good for the film for a hot second, but it's not. It's disjointed. There has to be something that's that's threading. When I've worked, like I worked with um, an artist that's done really well in sync. Her name's Anna May, and we had one song that's been used 14 times, and it's because we all came to the table with her like listening to her voice and where is her chocolate in her voice where is her her best moments and sticking those and making sure every song has those those moments in it because if you don't have that you're only showing again it's getting into that mediocre place what's your best put your best forward so when i'm looking when when i get people contacting me whether I'm, i have a couple <coughs> directors that bless you that was really loud sorry <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were trying to beatbox. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm when I have people contacting me about certain uh, styles, the best thing about being, you know, with coaching or working with producers is, hey, I know somebody that knows somebody, and and then that's relationships, which everybody knows makes everything happen, right? Everybody knows relationships. So you treat your people good, they treat you good. You don't piss on anybody's parade or, or try to make them feel small and that way everybody elevates everybody you don't have climbers trying to step on other people I, that's the thing I can't stand so if, if you help each other out then it works okay um, I wanted to just kind of get an, a kind of an opinion from from all of you because you're in different fields uh, as to what you're seeing in the actual cost of, of music today um, ha have you seen it change drastically with now all these networks and there's like four or five hundred TV shows going at the same time and uh, you know and there's multiple film cor you know corporations out there so are the fees for the you know original scores uh, for the actual opening and closing you know credits I mean songs or individual you know songs in the film itself um, are they Higher, lower, or staying kind of steady for a while? I think it's all over the board. I mean, I've seen it everywhere from low hanging fruit to <laughs> thousands of dollars to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just, it's like it's everywhere. It's all uh, a lot of it's how good you negotiate it, how bad they want it. Um, you know, I think Netflix pays well. I think there's some of these these different um, depends who it is. Just there's so many factors and in, in, uh, in my opinion as to you know to uh, what it is and and what you'll give into if you're you know to me you have to always be ready to walk away from the table if it's not enough money and not give in and then they'll usually if they want it bad enough they'll say well but we'll okay all right we'll do that you know that's my, in my experience I don't know I don't know I've, since COVID it's really gone up during COVID I be, there were a lot of concerts being streamed because no one was touring. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. if it's a live stream, you don't have to pay for it. But if you want to keep it up for a week, those, those fees started going through the roof and they haven't come back down. Uh, for me, it's the Wild West too, but overall, like the last 15 years, I would say they have gone down. So it's more of a quantity thing. I mean, mm -hmm. according to Mo, the, qual I mean, I, the quality always has to be there. Like she said, above the bar, but it's more of a quantity game, and it's just pennies here, pennies there, and that's just kind of the life we chose, I guess. But <laughs> I would say one more thing, if yeah. that's okay. Uh, one thing that that's working against me, and I'm uh, some of these guys as writers as well as uh, music libraries. Yeah. Stuff. Yes, music. Yeah. Guys, yeah. Uh, these they'll give yeah. it, give them it for anything for dirt cheap, and it makes it it lowers our value. And I would encourage you guys as directors, producers, like for sure that's enticing to find a library deal that you can then use however much you want, f unlimited for the same price. Um, but supporting local artists and, and independent artists is like such a, you get so much more quality <coughs> and so much more, you can work with them. You can, I mean, a composer can really craft this vision instead of just licensing library songs. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've obviously, as an independent publisher, smaller artists, we've all been hit by competing library deals. Um, I think we've seen some budgets go up, some budgets go down. Um, we are fortunate to have really great relationships with the music supervisors we work with, and 
trust that they do have the music budget and the artist's budget at heart. Like if they, they will fight for us to get more money for something. Um, and they, if they say, hey, we really don't have any more money than this, then we trust them because we've worked with them for years. Um, but yeah, there are some shows that the budgets are still just as high as they were when the show started. Um, and then, then there are some shows that have fluctuated and um, new shows that are coming on that are starting small. It's just, it's kind of all over the place. Um, I'm finding too that if I submit a budget, I'm saying, okay, this film only cost a quarter of a million dollars to make and what you're charging us for music is like, you know, way out of proportion to what it cost me to make this film, that the, the publishers will take that into consideration mm -hmm. now. Yeah, your music budget, which includes all licensed songs and all composer work, but anything in the music space should be 5% of your overall budget. So um, set that aside, and it's hard but because it's always the first thing people cut into when they're like, oh, well, we lost two days of filming because of weather. We need more money. Like, let's pull it from the music budget. That's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> so, but music, uh, may, don't you think, like, okay, this is a really, really crap example, but because... I'm gonna just say it. I went it to the is. Van Gogh experience. It is a character. If you, if you do, if you put your fingers in your ear, you don't get anything. But yeah. when the music takes you into the art, mm -hmm. that's to me when it's like wine and cheese. It's like mwah, love it because the music just makes it. It makes you feel mm -hmm. that heartbreak. It makes you feel that that joy. It makes you. I mean, the music is what makes me feel the picture. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's the emotional character. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. I love that part. <laughs> have you guys had uh, people come to you, I'm just curious, uh, where they have a song that they, they said they couldn't license? Well, they Every ask day. one of us, though. <laughs> they will ask one of us. I've had this happen to me multiple times. They ask you, hey, can you write something that's exactly like this song? We don't do sound-alikes. Um, a lot of libraries do a lot more sound-alikes or maybe more composers or producers. Um, but more so we get, hey, we tempt this in and it, we can't afford it. Um, here's what we really like about it. And so sometimes it's tempo, sometimes it's female vocals, sometimes it's what, whatever it is. Um, and like, what do you have that's similar but is still authentic? I always have an ethical conflict yeah. with that because that happens all the time. But yeah, they want like the vibe of it, like they want like it to a be a swagger. They want, Not necessarily yeah. sound like, but like it's got a swagger feel to it, or it's got like a chill vibe yeah. to it, where it's not, it's not. I'm not putting the same instrumentation, or maybe not. It's just the feel of it, right? That's what we get a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, a usually feel. for me, what they want is they want the exact tempo, feel, drums, instrumentation, and then you yeah. rewrite a song on top of that. That's what they want. That's skirting yeah. trouble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and, and it's not, and they're not liable for it. It's yeah. you're liable for it. That and actually so, brings yeah. up a good point, too, as far as when we get briefs. Sometimes you see a brief, I want it purple and brown. So, how detailed should the briefs be from these folks? Because, and then sometimes it's like, I want a combination of this song, this song, and this song. But, I mean, what what is a good brief? That's, I guess, you know, I get it all over the board, but what do you guys think? I mean, um, Brief meaning like what they're looking for? Yeah, like yeah. if you get a, a brief for an ad and you say, and it says, you know, we, for this Target commercial mm -hmm. or whatever, they can say we want it to sound in the vein of this artist meets this artist, right? Or is that is that too much? But don't you think that's like the relationship between like your per, your agent? Like if the agent knows the supervisor, right, right, then they know because it's like it, there's space, right, yeah. and they know okay, really what they're they're leaning into is the the meter or really they're leaning into the 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 pulse or, right yeah. the instrumentation yeah. sometimes the i can't tell if it's tempo or lyric yeah. they're going for or whatever right, it's right, just right. hard because it's not defined they don't well, say what i think a really good supervisor is yeah. i mean the role of a music supervisor i think in i mean they have so many different Translate. things they do but is to translate yeah. right. from the director producer who don't speak music right. mm -hmm. to the music people that they're corresponding to mm -hmm. and to be able to to convey that in a way that maybe it's you know very specific bpm or very specific things that are resonating maybe it's a playlist of 15 songs that they put together right. that kind of convey the sound the tone and all those songs are different but you can take you know 15 songs instead of one and say oh here's here's the through line between yeah. all of these that, that resonates yeah, I think Tra my 
I was going to say, a translator is a really good word mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. for, because we're dealing with people that don't have musical vocabularies. And some people, I've discovered even some people, especially in the jingle world, I've done about a zillion of those, um, that you have people who don't, they can't even distinguish between instruments mm -hmm. um, within tracks. All they know is, do I like what's hearing my eardrums? Right now, and it might and be one thing. they don't know until they hear it that they don't like it. <laughs> right. They're like, "Oh no, I, I don't want that." Yeah. Or, or they're say, like, "Well, that's what you described." So right. <laughs> yes, or they'll say, "I, I hate it. I yeah. hate it." And I go, "Well, that's exactly what you asked for, but it's it's only one little thing they they don't like. Right. It might be a little vocal phrase or a little instrument or something like that, and they can't describe it. So you have to draw out of them what it is using non-musical terms. So I try to get them to talk in adjectives. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it is. It's not feeling right about this." I was just gonna say, like some of the briefs, it's funny, like you'll see these briefs come across, which I'm sure we all get the same briefs. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'll look at it and it'll be, I don't know, this would be an extreme example. Looking for a Hank Williams Senior type song, you know, then all of a sudden you see the thing, you send everything you have, it's that, you know? And then you, uh, two months later when it comes out, it's like DMX. Right. Yeah. You know, and you're like, what, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I've gotten some that they yeah. describe <laughs> They use adjectives that are super vague. And so it's like, we want something that feels like summer. Right. And you're like, <laughs> that could feel like so, so many different things to so many different people. Or we want like this fun, feel good. Like in what tone? In what, like, so I think it's important to either give references or to have, um, yeah, either more, far more like tonality type mood type words instead of vague keywords. <laughs> that was yeah. great advice. Thank you all so much. I'm trying to, um, it's about quarter till, so I'm sure they're going to have us stop soon. So I was just going to have the panel go through and, and if um, anyone has a specific question they'd like to ask at this time, there's probably maybe 10 minutes at the max that we probably have left. Mm -hmm. Do you mean music? I've just done a bunch for Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, they recorded a tribute to Bob Dylan, so I've already licensed three of those songs to sync to the video. So. Do you ever hire yeah. people to be in those videos? Like no, I I'm not in the production end. I'm just in the music end. Okay. Yeah, I, we, I mean, when we have a really big placement that airs, sometimes the artist will take that and run with it and create a lot more content to kind of capitalize on that song. Um, so they'll they'll make music video, they'll do TikTok, they'll do all the things to kind of like keep that momentum going, but that's not necessarily our wheelhouse. Sometimes there are films that have music videos in them, mm. and what they'll do is they'll just they'll just drop it in there, and then as a composer, what you have to do is you have to write something that comes into it and then comes back out of it, and it sounds like it's part of it, but it's not. So I've done that several times. It's that's interesting. Yes, go ahead. Um, when, what, if you want to do a short film, for instance, and you found a piece of music that's, say, six minutes long, and you'd like to use that song and be able to chop it up for different scenes, is that possible? Yeah, anything's possible. possible. Yes, you, you have, have to, to license clearance, it. Yeah. 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 So get the license. there are right. different types of licenses. So if it's a very clearly different scene, different use, then it would be a separate queue, a separate you license. Can use, but you, uh, can, you, know, can, you can get a, a license that is in, ag they call it in aggregate. Yeah. View. But you have to kind of specify what scene it was in every time. And you have to license both the song and the master that you're using. So, which is why you see like all those Target ads with Beatles songs, but they never use the Beatles because they can't afford two yeah, sides. The my, yeah, <laughs> master side. Yeah. Yeah. But if this is more, a more obscure song, and many uh, parts of it work for different scenes. Yeah, we just have to put state that in your clearance request. What you want to what you want to use it for. Yeah. You had a question up here. Song that uh, the director wants. Um, mm -hmm. you, you 
rights. You can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's new. Yeah. You if you want to work, you don't have writers. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no such thing as writers block. <laughs> you have to knock work. it out. It's you know, and you do get 24 hours sometimes to, to turn something in, and you're up all night. I was gonna say you it. probably don't sleep. Yeah, but like I'll, there's a lot of different approaches. Like for instance. Um, I, sometimes if I'm just I, I can't sit down on the piano, I'll top line something else, and then, you know, just something for inspiration. But detune my guitar and play it. Mm-hmm. You get a whole different thing because you're not thinking chords. I mean, there's so many ways you can mm-hmm. find inspiration if you if you want to. Yeah. Well, then you can fall back on things you've done before. Yeah. And and realize that they don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like if you look at big producers, they recycle all the time. Yeah. Recycle their drums. Recycle this. Recycle mm-hmm. that especially the amount of music that you're writing that is never actually getting out there. Um, I mean, it's like hundreds and hundreds of hours of content that no one has heard. So it's not even that it's reusing it, it's it's yeah. new, it's still new. <laughs> yeah. You also just get used to kind of working that muscle and it's just kind of something that you're used to doing and you just kind of, I don't know. Yeah, you just don't have the option of, I don't have anything. Like that doesn't, I don't know. <laughs> you're, even if you don't have anything, you're gonna send them something. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, my suggestion would be to have a music supervisor, um, either hire them or have someone consulting just hourly or whatever to give you some advice, because a supervisor can bridge that gap between licensed songs and a composer and help to to find the composer that can fit with the licensed songs that you you have in mind, and also bring in someone to clear the licensed songs that you want or tell you you can't afford those and find replacements and offer other suggestions. I will write a lot of score that follows the theme of a song. It's, it's a, I mean, I do that a lot. We use like the kind of the, an idea of melodies and stuff that are in the, a song that they really want. It's going to be the theme song of the movie. And you write your score and according to that. Plus, you change your keys and everything of the score of the score to, to so it's not a drastic change. So I mean, if that's what you mean. And I can give you a specific example. We did that. There's, did you ever see the movie called Beautifully Broken? I if you saw it, it was, a, it was locally done. It came out in 18, something like that. If you some saw that, do me. Um, anyway, so there's um, the end sequence. I, I wrote uh, an entire score all the way to the end credits. And then after that was done, uh, one of the producers said, we're going to throw in uh, the song called Beautifully Broken. I think it was recorded by Plum, something like that. And it says, we're just going to shove it in there, and you got to write something up to it. And nobody liked the idea. I mean, <laughs> the director, director hated it. And nobody. Thought, but anyway, they said, he said, just make it work. That's all you got to do. And, and so, and so I did. So I wrote. So I rewrote the cue to make it sound like it was like a, like a really long introduction to the song. And then it ramped up into the song where where it started. So, and then then it goes and then it <coughs> credits from there. So, hopefully you'll never be able to tell where mine <laughs> starts and ends. So. There's a couple places. There's also a concert scene in there. Uh-huh. Um, who's that? That Christian rap artist. Um, anyway, there's the, mm, what's his name. Um, anyway, there's a concert, and then they, they, again, they, they, when they cut off, when he stops singing, they cut off the audio, the original audio, and it just goes to silence. And so I had to fill in and make it sound like the concert continued <laughs> while he was still talking on stage. So hopefully, they'll not be able to tell where one ends and the other begins. Okay. I um I'm not, I have to say we need to I was going to ask is it lunch is coming and it's going to be fabulous. Okay. 
<laughs> well, I guess from, from hearing all this information for all of you in whichever part of this industry that you are in, to summarize, it's probably to say that when you're working on a film, if you are a producer, director, and getting involved in some kind of a project, you see the importance of, of if, if you, especially a film, usually a, a composer is hired first so that you all can work out the plan for the entire film. And, and you know what your scenes are, the director, he knows what he's planning to do and whether he wants any words like in a song or not. And so that gives you a path so you know how much the composer is going to have in that f his job for that film. And then you fill in the different scenes where you're going to need the songs, whether it's source material for being in a car or it's going to be going into a restaurant and you've got back background music or there's going to be a party scene and somebody's you know having a party and there's music at the party. Or there's just some quiet music in a love scene, um, like Nora Jones when she did Made, that's a beautiful song in Made in Manhattan when she went to bed with the senator. <laughs> I mean, it was just beautiful. So you see how the music is really affecting the scene, and that's how it's, it's you know, the process is done. But I do think it's really important to remember, too, the vocal content, that voice. The, the voices are going to really help bring out the emotion of the scene. And so it's really wonderful to have people that really focus on that and help these different artists to achieve that goal. And I thank everyone on this panel for all the information they have given me. And thank you to Nancy. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, some really great music at the luncheon. So enjoy it. What were you going to say about songwriting? Nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 So that's your bill one? I'm, I, yeah, I just, uh, that's the day job. And uh, I don't know if you've come across uh, any of my kids or not. Because we're separate from the music school, so usually the composition students are. But uh, for music business. I'm, yeah, I'm audio engineering, okay. and music production under music business. So. Yeah. Um, no, thank you. Um, oh yes, well, it sounds like a great choice there. Um, the other thing, there was me too. Uh, the other thing I was gonna ask is uh, one thing I recommend is uh, to my kids is uh, if they don't have any background is, is Michael Winokur's thing. But I don't know if you know of any other international thing Michael's doing. That, Films for online seminars. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Yes. I recommend that. See, yeah. I didn't know if there's other resources that he. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Any resources that he. that out there for just students, you know, learning? Yeah. Michael's class would be great. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, if, you, if you have any like advanced students, there's yeah. one that's an individual tutoring. I, 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 I'm not okay. I've, I've done some uh, mentoring before. Okay. So, um, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm Dave. I'm Malone. Yeah. Here, I'll give you the card. I'm just I get extra, so I'm trying to get rid of him. He's so talented. Oh, no. I'm serious. Wow, you got a lot of, <laughs> lot of degrees there. Oh, my mom. Oh, that's yeah, not her. I have one. <laughs> okay. She has these. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Texas, Nashville, uh, New York, L.A. I was, I was so so you're trying to sneak out of yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So you write too? No, I'm fun. I can take friends. Yeah. Okay. I'm not very good. Oh, I'm yeah. 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 yeah.
Yeah. Like, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. But you guys are based yeah. in Nashville, or where are you based? Uh, so we live in Nashville. So yeah, I had a supervisor one time saying that we were on the. Your mom's still able to try to see him. Kids are scattered. Not the Nashville small. I just keep asking questions to see how big it's grown. That's awesome. So when they say we're up in Jacksonville, okay. Love to talk. Yeah, yeah. Dark. Like, okay. Thanks for coming. Hello. How are you? I'm Dave. 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 Nice to meet you. Oh, do you? Okay. Well, then you may know me, but I'll give you a card anyway. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm in the I'm, um, I'm the Curb College, so I don't know if you're in the Oh, see, yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I need to get over there. And, of course, I see David Schreiber all the time. I come around. Um, yeah, I'm on audio engineering. I haven't really been on campus because I've covered it. I just came back this semester. And uh, I teach the Devil Production class. And it's more like the songwriting, the class of the songwriters take. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then are you here because you're interested in film? It's like that part of CI? Yeah, I'm interested in producers. Oh, cool. I need to talk to this. So, um, send me your guys' number or whatever. Because... Um, Okay. I have a few artists that I work with that could, because I just assume she's exclusive, so that could go exclusive and all that, so, um, yeah, I'd love to talk to you, so, yeah, help. Well, in the, in the beautiful, way, and you know how it is at Belmont, it's like an incubator, the beautiful place that, I, that I'm in, that I'm in, that I've kind of been blessed with is that most of the songwriting majors come from my class, and then I get to kind of be, this between us, right, exactly, like, I go, let's collaborate, let's collaborate, right, so it's like, I'm the incubator before the incubator, and I always used to say, it's not little, it's not little bad, but then I ask the dean, he's like, no, it's great, because they get a placement, you get a placement, Every, it's like doing research together, you know, when they're, and then they'll get the deal, like the Devin Dawson's and all that, they'll get the deal, the players, they'll get the deal, like, three or four years after, out of Belmont, but I've, like, written with them, <laughs> yeah, so the hardest thing for me, though, and like I was saying about those agreements, is I'll collaborate with a student or an artist or whatever, and then they'll go, well, I want to move to Michigan and get married, because they're still young, or Hawaii, or whatever, and then I can never track them down. So that's why I do those agreements with everybody I write with, so that I can clear your thing. So I, I call them the agency agreement, but it's a very limited power of attorney where you say, look, like I couldn't sign our song to this without the permission. It's exclusive. I couldn't sign this exclusive. But if it's a, a non-exclusive opportunity, I can sign for them. So like if an ad comes to me and says, I need this song. So I don't, because like these people, sometimes it's hard to track down, especially when I write to students because they end up like, oh, all over the world, or they, yes, I guess, like, so some of my older co-writers passed by COVID. And Again, so like I said, I had to track them down, so I kind of do that to cover my bases. Um, I just kind of learned the hard way. Like, I had another so guy. Years um, of doing like commercialized stuff. No. So, yeah. 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 Trying to know some people. Yeah. Uh, well, Emily, what's Emily's Anyway, she's in the Smack Songs. Um, I forgot her yeah. last name, but we collaborated. Yeah. And well, nothing okay. against her or anybody, but yeah. she used yeah. her songs for Schedule A. Uh, so I then that we wrote. So then it's I tied up with the major uh, publisher. Uh, They're not going to want to do a license oh, for $1,000. Yeah. It's not even worth their time. But I want to do a license for $1,000. Yeah. So... She's then it's just hung up. It's like sitting on the shelf. Yeah, so right. then sure. I try to cover my bases where I can license everything. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm still, I'm still there. I'll, I'll be there until I die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been there. I got full professor and tenure like a couple of years back. So, um, Pays my insurance. Uh, and, uh, the beautiful like, like, thing about being oh, teaching oh, college is you yeah. have a lot of time to be able to do your own thing. You get summers, you know how it is, breaks, spring break, fall break, and then and then you get the insurance or whatever. 
And I'm then when you, when the cool thing about Belmont is that when I get a song in a movie or whatever, and it actually works for my credentials to like promote and everything. So it works together. And I love, what I love, I'm passionate about teaching the demo class, and I'll stop going on about it. But I'm passionate about it. Like, like I'll do a song and I'll, like, maybe it's a genre I'm not familiar with, like Afrobeat or something. I'll do that for film TV, then I'll bring it back to the classroom so the kids are like, oh, how do you do this style? I'll be like, well, I've done it already. So I feel like it reinforces. It's not like someone that's not practicing, it's not been in the studio since the 90s, you know? Yeah, so. so yeah. And what I need to do is I need to get more involved with like MOT and CDI to so figure out those synergies between those students who are graduating because they're going to need music for their films and all that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it would be cool. There is kind of, there's one, there's one class, the closest we come, the closest we come is to mass introduction class. And what they do, uh, is, and it's a cool little thing, yeah. but it's, yeah. the timing's got to be right. So the songwriting majors, I don't know, well, I used to teach the class, I don't know more. Alan Shacklock teaches it. Songwriting majors write a song. They uh, find an artist to record it, so the master production students record the song in the studio. Then the mixing students mix it, then the master students master it. And then the video for Columbia Studies do like a, some music video for it. All in one semester. All in one semester. But what I would love to do, we're not there yet. We're still breaking down barriers. Between. There's been this whole weird thing with the music department and her college where it's always been kind of separate in their own world, which is weird. But it's just politics. But what I would love to do is, again, motion pictures, like formalize it. Motion pictures need to score for their film. They go over to, they go over to the music school. They find composition students. Then, you know, right, maybe well, nice y'all facilitate yes. some type of music supervision nice where you find student you. songs and put it in the film. Right. And so all of that, yeah. I mean, yeah. those kind of classes need to happen Hi. more. Yes. It all happens, as you know, it all happens yeah. informally, oh, which I always yeah. say, uh, nice to meet you. Yes, I was, I can maybe I'll see you around the street, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you, you, you wear a lot of hats, man, so I'd love to, I'm sure there's some synergies there, you know. If nothing else, I'm just saying, because, you go to well. Belmont. Yes. That I, 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 I feel like I'm in an really interesting place that I see like and the incubator. Like I see all the talent before they yeah, kind of come through my good. class, and I'm like, yeah, um, collaborate with them. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> for your label or whatever, awesome. you know, I can. Yeah. Yeah. You need some. Too. I got it. Absolutely. Well, you write with Troy, right? I, well, I don't write with him. He sings a lot of stuff for me, but I, I write with Jack, and you're probably you know Jack. Jack Williams. Now the film composer. I love Jack. You know how I love Jack. But Jack's funny. With Jack's like. I'm primarily on the pitching side. Years back. He's like, Dave, I, I want to write a hip hop song. I was like, Jack, you don't write um, hip hop. He's like, no, but I know this guy from. It's a really quick role to kind of craft the whole music. No, not film composer. Like, from like, from 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 like I want to write, because you know, his background's country rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he's like, Dave, I want to do a hip hop song. Because I know this guy out there, the supervisor out in LA, he's looking for hip hop for some crime drama. And so we did a three way co write with Daisy McBride, which I don't know if you know her, but she's a. Up and coming yeah. female it's rapper in town, but I think it may be his only uh, one and only hip hop song. So joke, joke with him about that. He's, been, he's so funny. He's got that low gruff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I record a song. And he's like, I'd never be an artist. Yeah. I was like, let's work on it. And that's so important. Is like, no. like a Tom Waits if you kind of thing. It's kind of cool, man. Yeah, yeah. For film and TV, you want unique. Yeah, yeah. Learning and growing. And Troy was just over, and Troy was telling me it's so funny how everybody lands these roles. He's like, yeah, I'm producing a lot of demos. I'm like, how's that? Well, people just call me for the vocal and then I just hire it out. And yeah. do, I'm like, hey man, you know, whatever. He's such a great yeah, yeah. He's, 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 like he's on the top of my list, but I can't sometimes afford it. So. You know, yeah, trying to, like yeah. I said, like convey some ways to work together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll text you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good luck. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. you guys live here but yeah, town. just the, some. I mean, um, I was going to say, in, like, a lot of that stuff track, happens uh, informally. Yeah. Because, like, when kids come in, and this is always the dilemma, like, what should I major in? They're like, choose your audience. You need music production, music business, etc. It doesn't really matter because. You're collaborating with other, like if you You're wanted really to go major in audio engineering, you can still, <laughs> take, you can still fly, <laughs> write songs with people in the dorm. If you can make it, your oh, own experience, I'm because there's so much creativity oh, there. Yeah. See, I thought you were Right, I'm right. I'm in heels and I'm right. a confidence. Right. Right. That's what I've been told. Well, it's a, you know, and, and obviously you know the right people. So, yes. you know, I mean, it really is. You could, you 